Hey, I'm Melissa Fumero. And I'm Stephanie Beatriz. You may know us from television. Nine, nine. And now we're here with our very own podcast, More Better with Stephanie and Melissa. Join us as we take on topics like listening to yourself, the challenge of self-care, and making friends as an adult. We're going to share our struggles. We're going to speak to experts. And we're going to share everything we learn with you. Listen to More Better with Stephanie and Melissa on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey fam, I'm Simone Boyce. I'm Danielle Robay. And we're the hosts of The Bright Side, the podcast from Hello Sunshine that's guaranteed to light up your day. Like our recent episode with fellow podcast host and sports journalist, Carrie Champion. The making it starts to subside. The, it, that doesn't become the goal anymore. The goal is, am I really being responsible with what I have been given? Listen to The Bright Side from Hello Sunshine on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. A new season of Bridgerton is here. And with it, a new season of Bridgerton, the official podcast. I'm your host, Gabby Collins. And this season, we are bringing fans even deeper into the ton. Watch season three of the Shondaland series on Netflix. Then fall in love all over again by listening to Bridgerton, the official podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to catch a new episode every Thursday. Hello! Acclaim comics writer and notorious Scott Summers hater, Rosie Knight. Well, hello, Emmy-winning podcaster and totally unbiased Targaryen royal supporter, Jason Concepcion. Somehow the X-Ray Vision podcast has returned. And like always, we'll be here every week. You'll hear from TV writers, actors, comics creators, pop culture critics. Nothing is off the table. Listen to X-Ray Vision on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Life ain't always pretty, but hey, it's pretty beautiful, thing. Laugh a little more, thing. Tight, tighten up your core, thing. Said EK, you're kicking it with four things. With Amy Brown. Happy Thursday, four things, fam. I sat down with Jen Hatmaker the other day, and I'm so excited for y'all to hear this chat. She has definitely been through a lot the past two years, but the cool part is, is She's on the other side of it now, so she is a guide to us, and I think it's super cool. If you know anything about her story, I guess if you don't, then I'll just tell you right now. In 2020, she was hit with a big surprise and found herself suddenly getting a divorce after 27 years of marriage, and sometimes life does a 180 on us, and we don't really know what to do, and it can get really difficult and challenging, but Jen is here to offer us encouragement, and maybe your whole life starting over situation isn't because of a divorce. It might be a, a job that you're you're having to start over somewhere, a new career. You never thought that that was going to be happening to you, especially at you know, 40, 50 years old, or you have a different life circumstance that is causing you to start over. Whatever the reason is, Jen's story is going to offer you hope. She talks through the suffering and the loss and how she was able to heal and how she was able to rebuild so I'm very thankful for this chat. We also talk about being outside of your comfort zone because, yes, she's an author, but she just wrote a cookbook for the first time, which I think is super cool. We also talk about empty nesting. She went from having a house full of people <laughs> all the time to suddenly being alone. And that that is an interesting place to be. We also talk about gratitude, four things gratitude. And she gives us, you know, a cool TV show book a drink and an Instagram follow. So some good recommendations from Jen. But before I share with you the chat, I want to just update you on two things. One thing is that Haiti is in a real bad place right now. It has been for quite some time, but I just got a devastating email from the orphanage that they've had to close down the bakery, which I know a lot of you were a part of helping build that. If you bought a blue Pimp and Joy shirt back in the day, all the money went towards building that bakery. And that bakery being there is super important because it provides funds for the orphanage. It was a way for them to be more self-sustainable. And then also it provides jobs for people in the community there. And because of high prices of things, they've had to shut the bakery for a little bit. It's not permanent. I know it is temporary and it will open back up. But if y'all could be praying for the orphanage, 
and the safety of them, where they are is a real volatile area right now. So far, they've been good and they're behind gates, but it's just an uneasy feeling for so many of them right now. And they are such precious, precious people. And this bakery is such an amazing thing for them. And I hate that they've had to shut the doors. So just be praying for that whole process and just the whole country in general. And then also just know that there are some items up that go directly towards supporting different organizations that we work with in Haiti because all of Haiti is struggling right now. And there's four things items. There's fall items. There's Halloween stuff that's super cute. There's even non-fall stuff. You could customize a four things tote. You could get an I'm fine, it's fine, everything is fine. I've been living in the new faded maroon corded pullover that's so cozy and perfect for fall. But again, you don't even have to get an item. I'm just throwing this out there as an option if you want to shop and find a way to support fourthings.com or to see all the fall items that the shop forward has, theshopforward.com slash fall. And then second thing would be my live podcast event is coming up soon. I can't even believe it. And I am just giddy over those of you that are coming from other parts of the country. When we first set it up in Wichita, I just thought, well, it's probably just going to be mostly people from Kansas because that's just the first place we're going to do it. And then there's people coming from different parts of the country, which is blowing my mind. And I'm super grateful for that. And if you aren't familiar with what we're going to be doing, it's just, it's a girl's night. We're going to be keeping it real. It'll be like a podcast episode, sort of like what you're about to hear with me and Jen talking through four different things. I'll be going through four different things on stage and different people will be popping on with me. My sister is going to join me for a thing. Kat Defada will be there, who's my co-host for the fifth thing, and she's a licensed therapist. So she's the expert that's on hand to maybe walk us through some things, uh, especially if there's a, a listener Q&A. We're going to do an audience Q&A session, and I feel better having an expert on hand because I don't know what kind of questions y'all are going to be throwing our way. But we're going to be talking through some things in life. Like, are, are you really living? Are you stuck somewhere? Do you need to make a move? What's the next right step for you to do that? And then how are you going to show up in the world? And we've got some giveaways that we're going to be doing and then fun messages from country artists that you know and love, words of wisdom from them and some encouragement. So super special fun night ahead. We've been working on the video components of it and how everything's going to lay out. I had a big meeting about it yesterday and I'm just excited about it. So I was going to remind y'all about that. If you can make it Saturday, November 5th, selectaseat.com slash Amy. Now, with all of that said, here is my conversation with Jen Hatmaker. Here you go. When it comes to the first thing, the starting over topic, I have one of my favorite posts that you put up that I would like to, if you're okay with it, read your words back to you if that's not too awkward. Sure. All right. So y'all can scroll back if you go to at Jen Hatmaker and you can check out this entire post. It is from July 26th. And you did, you know, a side by side photo, one of yourself two years ago and one of you this summer. And then yeah. I'm just going to read your caption. I took this picture on the left and wrote this post almost exactly two years ago on August 6th, one day before my birthday. No one knew I was getting divorced yet, only that something had gone terribly wrong and I'd been off socials and we were in a catastrophic crisis. I can hardly look at this picture of me. I was so, so, so sad. I have never been that sad before or since. My face holds all the sorrow and shock and loss and grief I never wanted. I was at the bottom of the ocean. The pic on the right was today, standing under the same pecan tree in my backyard. Everything I wrote turned out to be true. All those things held. They delivered me back to me, that smiling, delighted, healthy, healed, whole person right there on the right. Whatever we built into our lives is what shows up when everything collapses. Not one good deposit is wasted. Not any of the hope, the love, the relationships, the faith, the honor, those keep. They occur. They metastasize. Hang on to all the good things you have, the audacity to still fight for, still believe in. Keep building, keep choosing what is good and right and true and lovely. Those will be there for you, beloveds. Without even meaning to, you will have built a gorgeous, strong, sturdy house that will shelter you during whatever raging storm comes. And when it recedes, you may stand under the very same tree two years later, smile from the depths of your little mended heart and mean it. 
keep going, darlings. That post meant a lot to me, and I'm sure hundreds of Mm -hmm. thousands of other people. But when it comes to starting over, I mean, that that post is a lot that has to do with that. And two years ago, you had to start over, and then here you are on the other side. So what is it that you have to say to people that might be in the midst of something Mm -hmm. or... Like you even said too, some people may be listening to this podcast and then they might remember it six months from now when something happens and they're like, oh, Mm. I need to go back and listen to that. Right. I mean, some of us start over because we choose to. We hit a, a fork in the road. We make a decision. We make a choice. And that is going to be a huge reboot. And some of us start over against our will right? Like we didn't want that. We didn't ask for that. We didn't choose that. We ended up losing something or it failed or it collapsed in some way that we didn't expect. And then we still have to figure out how to move on, whether or not we wanted to be there or not. That was the case for me. That wasn't a a start over that I wanted the loss of my marriage. And I think I've learned a lot in the last two years. The first is this, when I'm like thinking about your listeners, I'm 48. And so kind of right here in the middle-ish. And one thing that I have definitely learned is that this level of kind of pain and suffering and unexpected change at kind of this stage of life is really common. I felt really lonely for a million reasons. Divorce is the loneliest thing. It is the saddest, most awful thing that um, you kind of alone carry morning to night. Um, other people, of course, carry huge portions and with you the whole, whole time. And that was true for me. And, you know, your extended family does too, but it's yours. Uh, it's really, really lonely. But at the same time, and, you know, Amy, I spent a great deal of time, 15 years probably in leadership for which marriage and family was a cornerstone of what I taught about and thought about and talked about. And so I had this sense of failure that was so profound and like, how is this going to go? And what, am I a fraud now? Like I had no idea what the future is going to look like, but what I discovered is that you're just definitely not alone in starting over. It's just so common. My reason was this, but other people have a million reasons, but the process is similar. The process of sometimes like shock and loss. And then like this huge question mark, what the hell am I going to do? I have no idea what this future looks like because I'd planned this one. And so my community ended up being an immense support And so I'm thinking about people who are starting over and there's something comforting actually in knowing that you're not by yourself. That's literally comforting. And because it's not just a, it's not just the sense of it. Folks jumped into my life who had walked that path. So I did not know what I did not know. And I did not know anything about being divorced with five kids. I did not know anything about that. And so when people started saying, this is how you're going to feel right now, this is how you're going to feel next. This is how you're going to feel in six months. These are some things you're going to learn. These are some things that I want you to know in advance. Here's how you're going to recover. I mean, it was just unbelievably helpful to have people who literally understood. So they weren't just sorry. They weren't just compassionate. They literally understood what it was like to have to go into your bank and be like, how many accounts do I have? Like, what's my password? How much is my electric bill? I was starting over at that level. Yeah. I mean, for anybody that's, well, if they're not following you, they they should be. And again, the handle is at Jen Hatmaker, but I feel like I was following along on your journey and then you and I have caught up on the side as well. And it, yeah. I mean, it, so there's probably a lot of people in that situation where if you're sharing a life with someone, everyone has their different responsibilities. And so then suddenly everything is your responsibility for yourself. And you feel, yes, at whatever age you're at, you are now becoming a a new kind of adult again and these things that you feel like you should have known. And you even decided to put out courses because I think you learned so much. Yes, I learned so much. 
I learned so much, not because I'm so smart and so naturally good at personal <laughs> finance and um, and like time management. I learned because I had to. I mean, I had been married for 26 years, literally my entire adult life. I mean, I got married before I was an adult. I got married yeah. when I was 19. I was a child. And so to some degree, a lot of marriages have a division of labor and it's not necessarily a bad thing, That, but ours definitely was too demarcated. Anyway, that's a whole nother conversation, but yeah, like starting over at 46 where you were like, what kind of insurance policy do I have? And then just managing it all by yourself is no joke. It's no joke. And you're also, I was trying to walk my kids through their own like trauma and grief and, and keep a career going. And it was COVID. It was the very beginning of COVID. It was July of 2020. And so I'll just tell you that I would not go back to 2020 if you paid me $700 million. <laughs> I mean, there is no way I have ever had a worse year than that. But it is amazing what we're capable of. We are resilient. We are. And we're smart and we're strong. We're able to learn. It's not too late for us to learn. Just because we don't know something about something doesn't mean we can't learn it. And I discovered there's all kinds of people out there willing to help. Who can say, all right, get a pen, get a paper, bring your laptop, bring your calendar. We're going to sit down for three hours and we're going to hash this out. It was just unbelievable. Like my helpers came out of the woodwork. I got goosebumps when you said the word resilient because it's so true. And I think sometimes we don't believe that about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there's, you know, the negativity or the judgment that can creep in. And then that can just really take hold of you. So what do you have for us when it comes to that? Now you're you're on a public platform. And like you said, you had spent a bulk of your career yeah. focusing on <laughs> marriage and family, but having to to start yeah. over in that way, some people listening, they're not, they don't have a profile, but they have family members, they have friends, they have coworkers of and people that might be saying things. Totally. So what do we do with that? Well, first okay. of all, there's something we can do about that. That's going to happen. It will happen. And it does happen. And so people are just, it's, it's like a hobby for some people to weigh in from the peanut gallery on other people's pain. It's just what they'll do. It's what they're going to do. People will make snap judgments. We will be misunderstood. Listen, I hate being misunderstood. That is probably my least favorite category. I'm an Enneagram three. So the sense that people understand me correctly and, and have the full story and then love me for who I am is inappropriately deep, but it, it's going to happen. It is. And, and so I think there's this moment I think when you begin a process of like suffering and recovery, where you just have to say, there are some things that are mine to manage. They're in my little yard, my fence is around it and those belong to me. And that's mine. Some things are outside of my fence and that's one of them. What people are going to say or do what they're going to assume, what, if they're going to gossip, if they are going to speculate, if they are going to mischaracterize you or misjudge you, or even intentionally. Go with God, people. I I, I cannot be in charge of everybody's foolishness. So um, just laying that down on the front end and realizing that even if you are uh, misrepresented, you're not going to die. You're really not. They can't take you out. And they don't actually have a real bearing on your life. Like it feels so monumental. It feels so painful because you're already hurting. And then you're dealing with all this other like noise surrounding it that may or may not be true or fully true, which is probably more accurate. Something has to go. So what needs to stay is your own little heart and soul, your own personal recovery, your people that you love the most and love you the most, your little family, your closest friends, your absolute closest colleagues, like your, that all stays, that stays and stays and stays. So you're going to have to decide where am I going to not give my energy? And for me, that was one of them. Cause as you can imagine, people wanted to wildly speculate about what went wrong, right? Of course they did. And I kept that really, really private because I get to do that. And I would tell anybody, I don't care if you're a public person or not, you have the right to privacy. And there is a difference between secrecy and privacy. I mean, secrecy is sometimes marked by shame or like untruth, but privacy you deserve. Everybody does not deserve a front row seat to the details of your life, particularly your pain. And so I kept my private life private and I let the rivers rage all around me and it didn't take me out.
Hey everyone, I'm Mark. I'm Greg. I'm Brendan. And this is a trailer for a new podcast called Get It to Dutch, A Screenwriter's Journey. It's about screenwriting. And a journey. The three of us play aspiring screenwriters on a quest to get a hit Hollywood script to famous producer Dutch Huxley. Well, I would say one of us is aspiring and the other two are sort of struggling. Which one of us is aspiring? No, they're going to have to listen to the podcast. Hmm, but I don't know and I made the podcast. Well, I made the podcast and I think you guys were along for the ride. Each week we bring in a script, we read it, and then we give each other notes. And you'll also hear about our adventures navigating the Hollywood cesp- uh, system. The show features amazing guests like Tim Robinson, Lily Sullivan, Weird Al Yankovic, and Rob Hubel. And like any great blockbuster, it's filled with heartbreak, adventure, suspense, and just a little tasteful nudity. And some distasteful nudity. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Listen to Get It to Dutch, a screenwriter's journey on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. From LinkedIn News, I'm Leah Smart, host of Every Day Better, an award-winning weekly podcast dedicated to personal development. Whether you're looking for ways to shift your mindset or seeking more fulfillment in your life, we've got you covered. You can build internal resources. That's what the study of psychology is about, building internal resources. Turning towards is one of the most important elements of successful relationships, no matter what kind of relationship it is. The thing that underpins all of this productivity stuff is finding a way to make the journey itself enjoyable. The journey is the destination. The beauty of uncertainty is infinite possibility. When you don't know what's next, you don't know what's next. And thus, anything can be next. Join me as we dive into captivating stories and research-backed ideas that have empowered me and others to lead lives with more clarity and intention. Everyday Better, making growth an everyday practice. Listen to Everyday Better on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. On a summer night in Paris, American artist Lee Krasner is drifting off to sleep when the phone rings. On the line, news that her husband, Jackson, is dead. Jackson, as in the painter Jackson Pollock. He might, to this day, be the most mythologized figure in American art. But how much of the story that we've been told about him is just that, a myth? On Death of an Artist, season two, Krasner and Pollock, the story about how the art world changed forever and the story of the artist who reset the market for American abstract painting. Just maybe not the one you're thinking of. Listen to Death of an Artist, Krasner and Pollock on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey there, I'm Dr. Maya Shunker, and I'm a scientist who studies human behavior. Many of us have experienced a moment in our lives that changes everything. A moment that instantly divides our life into a before and an after. On my podcast, A Slight Change of Plans, I talk to people about navigating these very moments. The last couple of years has been the hardest season of our marriage for sure. I'm surprised our marriage survived it. I think we both are. I think we both were barely holding on. Mm. Nothing compares to how hard this is. Their stories are full of candor, awe, and hard-won wisdom. And you'll hear from scientists who teach us how we can be more resilient in the face of change. True behavior change is really identity change. Every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. Listen to A Slight Change of Plans on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, you said a minute ago we, we couldn't pay you, I don't know if you said like $7 million or something crazy, sure. dollars to go back to 2020, which I, I feel that. I feel like my 2021 was like that for me. Mm, yeah. The worst year of my life. But, mm. you know, now that we're on this the other side, like I read your post from this summer that I mm-hmm. shared at the beginning, and I read that because I knew it would be such encouragement to people. And if they go look at the picture, you do look like a different person. Yes. It's night and day. I Mm -hmm. see it. To me, I would have seen that picture two years ago and not really know anything. But when you see Mm. it side by side with the gen now, you're radiant, you're glowing, Mm. you you have a lightness about you. It's different. So you went through all that. And then there was the healing. And then there's all these fun things that are happening to you now, like Mm -hmm. (coughs) Tyler Merritt, Mm -hmm. uh, um, the new boyfriend, and all these exciting things too that you never thought would be a part of your story at all. So it's like, well... I don't want to go back to it, but I guess I'm glad it happened because look at me now. 
It's the weirdest thing. I mean, I know people say that all the time and I wish it weren't true. And I actually hate this system. I really do. I hate this awful system that we tend to grow the most, to learn the most, to become wiser and kinder and more gentle, more honest through pain. And I just hate that. That is the worst. Like, why can't we get all those goodies on the other side of happiness? Why doesn't happiness produce it? But it doesn't. It's it's pain and it's loss and it's fear and it's failure. And, and so almost none of us would choose to go back and pick those seasons of life. However, we can say, and I can say it, and I know you can too, like authentically, I mean it sincerely. I am now grateful. I mean, I really am. I am so great. When I think about me right now, like what I know now, what I am capable of, what I can do, what I've done, frankly, how I have recovered and how I held on to my own honor. I am like so proud of that. And also it's given me a confidence I did not have before. I didn't know what was missing until I had it now, but now I'm like, okay, boy, I learned some hard lessons the hard way, but I know I'm now, I know I'm now, and I will walk with this in me, through me, really all the rest of my days. And so that's not, it's a cold comfort when you're hurting. People told me that right in the middle of it. Like, oh, you wait till you see you on the other side of this. I'm like, I don't want to. I don't want to see a me on the other side of this. I want to see me who I was like, I want to go backward to where everything made sense. I know it's not comforting, but it is still true that if we can hang on and if we can hold on, like you read earlier to everything that's good, that we care about, that we value, it will see us through. It really will. And it will deliver us stronger and better on the other side. Yeah. It's almost like uh, suffering is just, it's stupid. It's stupid. (laughs) I hate it. But then it's also completely necessary. It is. And it changes us for better, for the better. If we'll let it, if we'll let it. If we'll let it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like you could have wallowed in your pain for two years and become this miserable person inside and out and just not morphed into this this lighter version. Yeah. I will, people have to go look at the picture. It's not, and then you can do this in your own life. Go look at pictures of yourself yes. maybe at one point in your life. And it's really wild how you are mm-hmm. able to see it. And then if you're not there yet, you might be in picture one, but let that be encouragement and hope mm-hmm. that picture two is there for you. Yes. But you have to know it. Like Jen said, I'm glad you said mm-hmm. that. You have to believe that it is possible and it's true and that you do have the capacity for all the things and that you will get to the other side and you can right. heal. And then starting over is suddenly not daunting. It can, I, right. I've been going through some things that seemed so daunting, mm. so daunting. A year ago, I wasn't even frankly really going to go through it because it's too daunting. And then mm. once you get there and you're in the process of it and you're doing it and you're surrounding yourself with people and you have the advice yes. and the love and the care and the tenderness and you you put in the work, it's your, it's your yep. garden and you're taking care of it. Suddenly it's like, oh, there's a little flower sprouting or it's there's true. a little vegetable popping up there and you see it and then you get excited about it and then it's less daunting. It's so true. And it builds something into you too. You are able to handle the next thing better. Your fear diminishes. Now that I feel like I have faced the most impossible scenario I could ever imagine. And I did it. I'm like, okay, come on life. We can handle this. We can. And it's day by day. And I appreciate you saying this because it does also matter. Time is a huge factor, but also so is the work. So you do have to be a proactive agent in your own healing. You do have to do that. I don't find that that sort of recovery just lands in our lap like a miracle. It comes because we decide to get really serious about our own junk. We go to therapy. Um, We handle our health. Like my blood pressure went through the roof. My body fell apart. So I went to my doctor and went, help me, help me. We're sleeping. We are surrounding ourselves with people who love us and believe in us. We are dealing with our own junk. We've got stuff. We've got stuff. We're not perfect. So I think the work cannot be ignored either. Because sometimes you, that's the last thing you have the energy for. You just want it to not, you just want it to all go away, but that's not how it works. And so that like slogging away 
chipping away at the the mountain of just impossibilities is kind of what gets you there. And then you're like, look what I can do. Oh my gosh, look what I can do. It's amazing. It really will change you. I feel like you sharing this whole starting over chat is going to be comforting to a lot of people, but also Mm -hmm. what is comforting to a lot of us, especially me, now that I'm in eating disorder recovery, like I think about Mm -hmm. certain things that used to stress me out, but now I love food and I'm allowed to love food and it's amazing. And your cookbook, I feel like food in the meantime, (laughs) while you're doing the therapy and all the things, you can also enjoy some carbs because that's That's going to bring you comfort. So Uh But the cookbook for you was stepping outside of your your comfort zone because I've read several of your books. Um, Jen is a New York Times bestselling author and things have grown off of that, but it started with books and speaking. And then of course you have your For the Love podcast and you love books. You have a whole Jen Hatmaker book club. You have all the things, but your books I have enjoyed, but in the food lane, like a cookbook is a totally different monster. It like is. what, why would you think you're suddenly qualified to <laughs> write a cookbook? I mean, I, if I have asked that question once, I've asked it 40,000 times. <laughs> you know, what's so funny is like as a bridge between these two uh, conversations is that for me, at least it turned out that cooking and food writing, specifically the, the whole project was a part of my kind of healing work because for me, creating, being a creative, um, writing. And then of course, just this like nurturing practice of cooking, which is just knife, onion, butter, sizzle, music, glass of wine. It's just nurturing in and of itself, putting my energy and my attention on a project like that, that didn't just literally feed my people, but it kind of fed my soul a little bit. It fed my creativity It it worked out a new muscle that I'd never really used was also a huge part of recovery for me. And so I think there's this moment when anyone is staring down a project that is just ridiculous, where you're like, I am not credentialed. I am not qualified for this. Um, Or if I am, it's barely. Or it just feels scary, like high risk, could fail, which by the way, it's always true. Welcome to the human race. Um, We are not guaranteed outcomes. I think there's this moment of hubris where (laughs) you just either decide or you don't decide to say, I'm going to go for this because I want to. That's really it. Like I did not have another sense of like guaranteed success here. I don't have it now. Hell, that book's not out. I have no idea how this book is going to do. I, I, I have absolutely no idea, but I wanted to do it. Like I just wanted to, I really did. I could not think of anything else I wanted to put my energy toward. It was so fun and it was so different for me. And it was during the worst year of my life when I wrote it. And so it just provided this space where my sad little brain could go and have some respite and then have some tacos, you know, like it's just what I needed at the time. And so I love any time I am talking to an innovator or an entrepreneur or a risk taker uh, in any capacity and in any category where they're just like, I just decided to do it because I wanted to. I'm like, I love it. I love to see it. I think that sort of risk and confidence and passion is often rewarded one way or another, commercially or not, but one way or another, it gets rewarded. Well, I feel like you're inspiring someone listening right now. I know it. It may not be for a cookbook, but it might be for something else that they're just, you know, on the edge about. Let this be your permission to go for it. And, you know, you Literally. mentioned tacos and I know you uh-huh. posted something the other day. Cause again, yeah, the book's not out. Well, depending, podcasts are weird because people listen, uh-huh. but it's officially coming out on October 18th, 18th. which is next yeah. Tuesday. So it may be out if you're listening to this late, but I'll link it in the show notes, but it's called Feed These People. And I love the different category, like the different sections, you know, uh-huh. cause in most cookbooks, it's like, oh, appetizers, dinner, breakfast, dessert, but no, Uh, not you. Yours is like food that goes with carbs. Right. (laughs) um, Food when you have no more dams to give. And I'm like, that's "That's a chapter I can get into because yeah, yeah, you just flip to that when you know you need that. Or I think your sides one is like, 
foods that go with other foods. <laughs> That's right. You know, this is because I'm not a credential cookbook writer. Like to your earlier question, like, why do you get to do this? I have no idea. And and when I first wrote it and I turned it in, I mean, I just didn't follow any recipe writing protocol. I didn't follow cookbook protocol. I just wrote it the way I would want to read it. And I just wrote it the way I've been writing recipes for years and years and years online. So that part is not brand new. I've just always written these long, rambly, bossy things. And so everybody's like, if you write a cookbook, it needs to be just like this. I'm like, well, good, because it's the only way I know how to write. And so my sweet, sweet editor who has edited so many like best-selling cookbooks, she's like, um, <laughs> this is different. I'm like, I told you, I told you up front, but I think maybe that's fun. It doesn't bother me to break a mold. It's more important to me that I feel like I can stand by it. Like this is very Jen Hatmaker, this cookbook. I maybe have never written a cookbook before, but if you know me at all, you will read what every page, like this is so Jen. And so that to me feels like it has integrity in it. Like I wrote the way that I would write. It's absurd. Like, in fact, I don't like dessert really. Like it's just not, a, I'm not a sweet tooth and I just like salty food. But um, my best friend's son, who I used to give baths to, and now he has like a mortgage, he's grown, was like, if you don't have a dessert in this cookbook, I'm not buying it. And I was like, well, so I made a dessert chapter and it has one thing in it. Huh. One dessert. <laughs> that Can was, we get to know what it is? It's creme brulee. Or... It's my only dessert that I love the most in the world. So that's it. I was like, I'm going to give you one dessert. And if you want more, I guess just drink some champagne. I don't know what else there is. And so it is non-traditional, this cookbook. From LinkedIn News, I'm Leah Smart, host of Every Day Better, an award-winning weekly podcast dedicated to personal development. Whether you're looking for ways to shift your mindset or seeking more fulfillment in your life, we've got you covered. You can build internal resources. That's what the study of psychology is about, building internal resources. Turning towards is one of the most important elements of successful relationships, no matter what kind of relationship it is. The thing that underpins all of this productivity stuff is finding a way to make the journey itself enjoyable. The journey is the destination. The beauty of uncertainty is infinite possibility. When you don't know what's next, you don't know what's next. And thus, anything can be next. Join me as we dive into captivating stories and research-backed ideas that have empowered me and others to lead lives with more clarity and intention. Everyday Better, making growth an everyday practice. Listen to Everyday Better on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everyone. I'm Mark. I'm Greg. I'm Brendan. And this is a trailer for a new podcast called Get It to Dutch, A Screenwriter's Journey. It's about screenwriting. And a journey. The three of us play aspiring screenwriters on a quest to get a hit Hollywood script to famous producer Dutch Huxley. Well, I would say one of us is aspiring and the other two are sort of struggling. Which one of us is aspiring? Well, they're going to have to listen to the podcast. Hmm. But I don't know. And I made the podcast. Well, I made the podcast. And I think you guys were along for the ride. Each week we bring in a script, we read it, and then we give each other notes. And you'll also hear about our adventures navigating the Hollywood cesp uh, system. The show features amazing guests like Tim Robinson, Lily Sullivan, Weird Al Yankovic, and Rob Hubel. And like any great blockbuster, it's filled with heartbreak, adventure, suspense, and just a little tasteful nudity. And some distasteful nudity. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Listen to Get It to Dutch, a screenwriter's journey on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. On a summer night in Paris, American artist Lee Krasner is drifting off to sleep when the phone rings. On the line, news that her husband, Jackson, is dead. Jackson, as in the painter Jackson Pollock. He might, to this day, be the most mythologized figure in American art. But how much of the story that we've been told about him is just that, a myth? On Death of an Artist Season 2, Krasner and Pollock, the story about how the art world changed forever. And the story of the artist who reset the market for American abstract painting. Just maybe not the one you're thinking of. Listen to Death of an Artist, Krasner and Pollock on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey there, I'm Dr. Maya Shunker, and I'm a scientist who studies human behavior. 
Many of us have experienced a moment in our lives that changes everything. A moment that instantly divides our life into a before and an after. On my podcast, A Slight Change of Plans, I talk to people about navigating these very moments. The last couple of years has been the hardest season of our marriage for sure. I'm surprised our marriage survived it. I think we both are. I think we both were barely holding on. Mm. Nothing compares to how hard this is. Their stories are full of candor, awe, and hard-won wisdom. And you'll hear from scientists who teach us how we can be more resilient in the face of change. True behavior change is really identity change. Every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. Listen to A Slight Change of Plans on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So when it it comes to testing things for cookbook, I don't know if when you were blogging about recipes, if you had to be super thorough, because it's like, oh, okay, I made this for my family, it worked. But a cookbook seems like next level. How many times did you have to cook the recipes? And then who do you trust to taste them and tell you what's up? And then was there times you had to go back and be like, okay, fine, I'll add this? Yes, times a million. It's a whole thing. Like, guess what? Writing a cookbook is kind of hard. (laughs) <laughs> like I was just thinking, oh, you know, let's just throw it all, let's just throw it all together. Like I do, which is kind of imprecise and like, I don't have a lot of measurements and I'm kind of like, just put some in that is not going to fly. And so I had to put so many recipes in a test kitchen so many times. And then everybody around me is testing it. I have my friends come over and they're eating like five completely non-cohesive things. Like it that doesn't go together at all. I'm just like, I need everybody to write their notes. Some things just absolutely failed and I had to redo over and over. And then I would send them in and my editor was like, we got to tighten this up. Like there have to be quantities. And I'm like, ah. and then I would go back and write down all my quantities. So my friend, Danielle Walker, she told me, she was like, Jen, I can't, stress this enough, really for all cookbook writers, but particularly how I think you're probably going to be. She's like, you need some test kitchen recipe people, like recipe testers. And I'm like, oh, that is so smart. So we recruited like 300 people and gave them the whole book, like way before it was solidified and said, can you test all these? I cannot tell you how many changes I made because of their feedback. So yes, it's, it turns out it has to be a little bit precise. So I got it as precise as I possibly could. And after that, I was like, just print it, like just publish it. People will figure it out. Okay. Well, first of all, my brain is like, wait a second. That's a, that's a gig. That's a job. So when you send Uh these, I mean, I'm, these are probably just normal everyday people, but it's like a side hustle for them. They volunteer or they get paid. No, no, no. volunteers. This is my community. I literally just went on socials and was like, is there any way anybody would be willing to test like two recipes out of my cookbook? And everybody was like, yes. Okay, cool. I thought you pulled from like a database of like, I oh, test recipes for just home $20. Cooks. Like, <laughs> this is a cookbook for normals. Like it's a cookbook for normal people. So I'm like, I need to see if normal people can follow this recipe and make it. And then I'll, that's a success. So when it comes to food, what role does that play in your life? Because I have a feeling that I'm going to really love your answer. It's always been super central. And for a million reasons, I genuinely love food and I genuinely love cooking and I genuinely love feeding people. So it's just this perfect excuse to gather your favorite people around a table. Everybody wants to eat and nobody wants to do the work. I mean, literally, this is it. This is how you get people in your door. I thought this early on with kids. You know, I have five kids. And so I learned the secret right around the teen years when I was like, what do I have to do to keep them here? My old tricks don't work anymore. They're too big for that. Like, what do I have to do to become the teen house so that my kids want to be here and their friends want to be here? And it's cooking. And so this was my trick and my ploy for all those teen years, they will stay here if you will feed them food. And so I would just call up the stairs and be like, who's here? Who else is here? How many people are eating here? And that, I would just put out plates because it could be it could be two. It could be 14. And so food is such a good reason to come together. And then people are so people feel loved by it. 
People feel loved when you cook for them, even if you make them a hamburger. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the thing is. The thing is that you put your hands to it, that you made it with love and you invited them around your table. That's really all that matters. And so that connective tissue to me, both in my family and just in my little community here, I I can't figure out a substitute. I can't think of anything that I love more than that. And so I think that's why I wrote it in the first place. Food can be some people's love language. And that's that's, right. I grew up with a dad where that was what he did to show people, hey, I love you. I want to gather people. I kind of wish he had expressed things verbally more. Mm. (laughs) But, you know, Mm -hmm. looking back now, you know, I realize on times that I miss that opportunity to connect with him again, because I was Mm. dealing with my own stuff that I had going on with food and it gave me a lot of anxiety and it sucks now. And I say that to just encourage people, like if you are struggling with food and body image stuff, like that hard work Jen and I were talking about a little bit ago, like invest in that. It is so worth it to get yourself help. And I speak as someone on the other side of that because I missed opportunities around the table. I missed the yummy things because I would bring my own meal. And then of Mm. course I, that would break his heart. I mean, Mm. he never really said much to me, but he was sort of confused. Like what is happening? Why does she just bust out her own Tupperware when everybody else is enjoying this? And my dad was a phenomenal cook and he has so many amazing recipes and we lost him last year, but something my sister and I have tossed around Jen is doing a cookbook of some of his stuff. He used to have restaurants in Austin and we, did he? I don't think he I knew did. that. Yes. Back in the eighties, like one of the most ones that's special to our family was one that he named after my mom. It was, we grew up in Onion Creek. So South yeah. Austin yep. and yep. right across where I don't know if Crumley's was there when y'all moved to Austin, but now it's like a car dealership, but it's right at the Onion Creek I-35 exit. I know and exactly. my dad had a restaurant called Christopher's and my mom's <laughs> maiden name was Christopher. And it was, I spent a lot of my childhood there and you know, my brother mm. was a, a waiter there. It was black tie. Um, oh. A lot of people from Onion Creek would come over and like have dinner. And my sister and I were looking at the menu actually a couple of weeks ago. And my sister is a beautiful writer. Like she's so good. And she's sort of coming into her own thing right now. And her husband have a show on HGTV. And she's, I'm making her go to um, Allie Fallon and Donald Miller do a, a workshop called Write Your Story in a couple of weeks. And I'm yep. making her come and she's going because yep. I'm like, you, Christy, you're going to start writing. She's, oh, Jen, like she's who introduced you to me. She Was had she? seen you speak somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So she's responsible for my I- introducing you to me. But when, it, you know, talking about cookbook and I'm kind of going off on a little tangent here, but I think it's important for people to hear sometimes is that I don't want you to waste any more time not gathering with people around food Mm. because I wasted a lot of that. And there's so many special memories that can be made and so many recipes. Also, I wanted to say this, like ask your parents for recipes, ask your grandparents, start collecting them now because Mm. now that my dad's gone and what if one day my sister and I do do that, which now I'm like, oh shoot, looks like it's going to be a lot of work. (laughs) There are people that can help you. Um, I love this idea. What a wonderful idea. Like to both like honor and remember your dad, but also your family and your future. I just think that is so fantastic. There are so many cool memories to pull from, like from the restaurants. And for, I don't know. I just think this is fantastic, especially if she loves writing. Like between the two of you, you could pull it off. Yeah. Like she can do her fancy, cute writing uh-huh. words and draw people in. Y'all are very, she's very, she's, engaging. she brings you in, engaging. Uh-huh. Yes. And, you know, I don't know. I can just remind people eat the dang food. Like it's not worth Uh sitting out on. So, and Uh then we both have different stories around the different foods and recipes, but you did this for your kids, Jen. Now your five kids, they've got feed these people. And I don't know, I'm sure we have another one coming. I hope so. You'll do feed these people. Keep feeding these people. Part two. Keep feeding these people. Exactly. (laughs) Feed these people more. Which, you know, I I can't imagine what your household is like now that you Mm. don't have all those people you're feeding, like you said, you would yell upstairs, how many people are here? And sometimes there'd be 14. And now what are, what are you doing with yourself, with all your kids gone? Like you said, you're 48. Most empty nesters are like 60 something. I started early. It's because you have a unique situation too, with your high schooler studying abroad, but still 
I'm like empty nest almost kind of it temporarily my I've got five kids and my fourth just went to college so he moved out and he's a freshman but my fifth my baby is in Spain for the year doing a foreign exchange program and so she'll be back next summer and then home for her senior year so I'm not all but for right now Nobody lives here except for me. And it is so weird. And I cannot figure out what to do with food. I mean, I just cannot figure it out. I I cook because I like to cook. I actually like to cook. I look forward to cooking. And so it also, that's the end of my work day. I'm so happy to like put my stuff away and get my knife and get the, put the music on. Like I love that hour, but nobody lives here. So I end up cooking what I think feels like this is probably about right for one person and it will feed me for four days. I cannot get it right. Um, and so it is a little bit strange. So the solution here, which is a good one, is that my brother, I'm the oldest of four kids. We all live in Austin. My brother and his wife and his two sons who are two and four live five minutes that way. And so I'm telling you three nights a week, I'm like, y'all want dinner? And they're like, we'll be there in 30 minutes because they're they're young working parents. And so I feed my brother and his family all the time and I'll make him anything he wants. I don't care. I'm like a short order cook. What else are you doing though with this time, this gift of time that you have? Hopefully you're using it to your mm -hmm. advantage, even just self-care and mm -hmm. taking care of yourself. Because like you said, you got Remy will be back like yes. in a year, but even still one child, pff, that's nothing. It's like, it's, okay. it's, it's like I'm finished. Yeah. That's a really good question. It's only been four weeks. And so I'm still very discombobulated. And I was telling my girlfriends this weekend, we were together watching football and I was like, my days feel the same, busy, busy, busy work. It's work. And it's all this. That is not the difference. The difference is when work is over and it's nighttime. So cooking, and then I'm discovering I am bored. Like I am just bored. So, you know, I have a Tyler is the man that I'm dating, but he lives in Nashville. Um, and so he's not here on the daily. Otherwise I'd be spending a ton of time with him and I do, but it's in travel. And so I'm like, I need something to do. I am too busy of a bee to just not have anything. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I need, it's like, I need a hobby or I, I'm not quite sure. I haven't figured it out, but I'm like, like, this is the gift of, I keep going to bed at like eight o'clock. Cause I'm like, I don't know what else to do. I'm just going to go to bed, I guess. Like, is it too early? <laughs> I mean, no, it is never too, no. Okay. Actually, you're right. I, I love an 8 PM bedtime. And I, I don't know if it's you that I'm pulling from stuff I've seen on socials, but don't you have this thing about baths? And I know you drew Remy a bath and you went off yeah. on this whole thing of like, Hey, parents, sometimes right. just your kids just need a bath or a moment. So I don't know. I feel like you need to speak to that. I've had three baths this week, three. So, and, and primarily because I'm just trying to fill time. I'm like, how can I fill time? <laughs> let me get a, let me get a book and I'll get in the bathtub and that's going to take me 30 minutes. And so I think I will get used to this. And you know, all my best friends live right by me too. Like literally right by me. We're on the same street and one street back. And so we spend a ton of time together. Three of us are empty nesters. It's like we have a little gang that we've activated now that we've raised all these kids. You know, we have matching scooters. I don't know if you've seen that before, like <laughs> Vespas, like for real, they are so legitimate. And we have a golf cart and we are just forever tearing it up down here in Buda, like on our Vespas and on our golf cart. And so we're having fun. People are asking me, are you so sad that all the kids are gone? I'm like, is it okay to say that I'm not? that I have been parenting since I was 23 years old. And it feels kind of nice to just have a break in my brain where I'm just not solving teen problems all the live long day. It's kind of nice to be honest with you. Are those the same friends though, too, that do you do Friday night pizza night with that crew? Uh -huh. Yep. Every Friday. Which is another food thing, but I, I feel like your, your ideas of how you're living and you've always been a very social person. And yeah. again, it does involve the food component. Cause I know you used to post about a supper club. I don't know if you still uh -huh. do that, but uh -huh. do. just you're very intentional with connection and fun. I know you're a three on the Enneagram, but do you have like a little bit of seven? 
Shauna Nikwes, my friend Shauna, always says that I'm a seven, um, that I have misdiagnosed myself, but I am a textbook three. But I do have this seven energy in me. I do love to have fun. and I. But I just apply it in a three way. Like a three is just always going to go all in. And so I go all in on fun as much as I go all in on work and it's going to be the best. I'm going to have the best trip and just we're going all out. And so you are right. That is a huge value in my life. Absolutely huge are my friendships and then also our commitment to each other to create experiences. So that means sometimes it's a big thing like a trip and sometimes it's a small thing like Friday night pizza night. But one way or another, that is not replaceable for me. That is not negotiable either. And so that, I feel like that keeps me even and healthy in a way that almost nothing else does. You mentioned Shauna. So I, my sister was sharing something with me. I think she learned it from her. I don't know which book mm-hmm. or what. She's read all of them. And she was saying something about how, because my sister got my dad's gene when it comes to hospitality and having people over and cooking mm. every meal and yeah. doing all the things. And she's basically, I don't know, Martha Stewart. And I feel yeah. as though I got none of that. Uh-huh. And it's annoying. And, <laughs> you know, I want to serve things on paper plates and let's just Great. make it easy. And my sister says, mm, no, food uh-huh. tastes better on mm-hmm. real plates. And I'm like, okay, well, we're, yep. I'm hosting 23 people and it's my house. So you can do the dishes. <laughs> she's That's like, right. She's like, okay, I will. So <laughs> I but will. She, she said uh, something to me, about Shauna saying, you know, hospitality is one thing or like you can host people and like have people over and be a good thing. But it's like, what about the experience? Mm. Like I want people, I don't want people to come and just feel like this is mm-hmm. you know, hospitable or whatever. I want them to walk away with an experience. Uh-huh. And I thought, oh, you know, and that's just, that can be around food or that can just be like in life in general. And I feel totally. like I need to get there. Kind of what you're saying of like you're, you're all in and you're living for fun and creating experience with your uh-huh. friends. And I feel like now, do you, you, if you, have you always been that way or is this part of like the new you and like you, do you feel like you're living life more than you were the previous years before you went through all the suffering and then the growth? Hmm. Is it like Gen 2.0 or how would you describe that part of you? Like the fun mm-hmm. part? I would say this part of me has been baked in for a really long time. Okay. This precedes all this loss. And thank goodness, because my friends were an absolute lifeboat for me the last two years, because we've spent zillions of hours together. Uh, It can never count. Um, And so this has been a really baked in part of my life, really, as long as I can remember. But going back to something you just said about creating an experience for people, which I've always loved to do, too but not necessarily in a fancy way. So your sister probably gets a lot of joy from like using the beautiful plates and setting the beautiful table. And I do too, occasionally. Sometimes throwing a killer, beautiful dinner party is just fun and special. And you kind of pull out all the stops. But I, in my experience, both as a host and as somebody who goes to somebody else's house, I still get the whole experiential thing on paper plates. Like that does not defeat the, the sense of being like welcomed and it's the music, it's the people. Sometimes it's kitschy. Like we're going to eat on paper plates and we're going to dump it on the trash can because I want to spend more time with you than in the kitchen, scraping everything off of plates. Like that to me also signals I'm here to be a part of this with you. And so I think there's a lot of ways to create an experience that is lowbrow, that is absolutely like the opposite of fancy, the opposite of hard. Cause that also to me tells me, you know what? You are not trying to impress me. You are just welcoming me and I can feel the difference. You know, I feel welcomed. And so I love that just as much when you walk into somebody's house and all their shoes are by the front door. I'm like, love it. I love it here. Like this is warm. I feel like I've got to say this now because my sister's going to listen back to this and then be all irritated at me. I, I should clarify uh, uh-huh. The time I was hosting 23 people and when she wanted to eat off real dishes, uh-huh. it was Thanksgiving day. Okay. <laughs> and so, yeah, we were, uh-huh. it was, we were creating a, uh-huh. a special experience and she's not a, like a, she just probably would want me to clarify. So she didn't put, get put in that some she's like fancy, fancy every day of her life. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. And that she too can eat off paper plates, but she's all about, I feel like y'all are, y'all are very similar, but 
Christy, that's just my disclaimer. So we know, Christy, you're not fancy seven days a week. And also I got real fancy on Thanksgiving. So I understand there's a time and a place for fancy. That's right. That's right. Okay. You want to do four things gratitude before we head out. So I would love to hear from you a TV show you're thankful for right now, a book, a food and a drink, and then someone to follow on Instagram. Oh, yes. I like these. I like these categories so much. I would love to see a list of everything everyone's ever said about these. Oh, that'd be fun to compile. Houston, uh-huh. my my producer, uh-huh. you can put that together. Thanks. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm forever asking this, these questions of people, like give me some recommendations. And so when I watch TV, it's at night. That's what I, when I get into bed and that's lights out, that's what, so my brain is done and it doesn't want a hard thing. It wants an easy thing. Um, and I generally like to laugh and I don't like to be scared. I don't like dramatic and dark. So thus what I love right now, which is kind of recently come out is dairy girls, the next season, which is season three. Have you seen this? Well, I haven't watched any episodes, but I know it's, it's not dairy, like a cow. It's like D E R R Y. That's right. It's the name of a town and it's in Ireland and it is, it's high schoolers. It's Irish high schoolers in this quirky little town. And it's just, it's so delightful that I howl with laughter. I just love it. So the third season just came out. You have to watch it with closed captions because you can't understand a word they're saying. It's just such a thick accent, (laughs) Um, but it's just, it's so funny. They're so quirky and inappropriate and just hilarious. Anyway, it's killer. Everybody go watch Jerry Girls. It's on Netflix. I'm going to check out season one since you, you just started season three, though, or that just came out. Yes. Yes. Okay. What about okay. a book? And my preference is to reach for fiction. Fiction is my favorite thing to my favorite thing to read when I'm thinking about gratitude, <laughs> when I'm putting it in the metric. Probably the book I've been most grateful for the last two years consistently, it's called Codependent No More. And it's been around for like 25 years, maybe even 30. It's by Melody Betty. And I hated to find out that I was codependent. I just didn't know what that meant. And I didn't know what it was. And Brene Brown told me I had to read that book, like right at the beginning of everything falling apart. And it just made me so much. Oh my God, it's right here on my desk. I did not it's marked up a billion. Look at it. Like, can you just see how many, every sentence is like, every single sentence is like underlined and starred. And oh. so I, I read that last year too, but I've worked my way through it. I feel like it's one of those books. Once you get it, sometimes it, for me, I felt at times I was overwhelmed because I was totally confused. And uh-huh. I was like, what? I don't. Uh-huh. So here's what I say. There's also a workbook that you can get. Yes. So you can get the workbook. Then you can also download the audiobook and you can listen to it and read it. Not, you don't have to sit there Smart. and listen to it and read it at the same time, but you can consume it at different times huh. and maybe read one chapter. And then later when you're driving, listen to that same exact chapter. Such so you, good advice. Yeah. Cause it's a lot. It is a beast. It's confusing. Especially if, if you're new to the concept, even which I was, Yes. Even just like getting it through my head was hard, then much less applying it. However, it has changed me in good ways, but it's, it's a heavy lift for sure. Okay. Yeah. And don't even don't, since Jen and I have now said, we well, you, you maybe probably could, but not me. Anybody that asks me to define codependency, I'm like, um, well, it can look a lot of different ways. (laughs) So like, just Google it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. <laughs> totally. It'll it'll make you want to make you want to drink. So let's move uh-huh. on to that. Uh, speaking you, of, <laughs> speaking uh-huh, of. good segue. So just this year in 2022, and I don't even remember what the impetus was it for it was. I think it was because it was the specialty where I was that night and someone talked me into it. But I ordered an old fashioned, you know, which is like a classic cocktail. It's just never, ever been my reach. If if I'm going to drink something, I like it to be wine. But I, I can't remember why. But they were like, you're just going to want to try it here. And it was so delicious. And so thus, I now have old fashioned on the brain. That is, I bought all the ingredients to make it my own self. Like I'm working on it with the little orange wow. peel and the bitters and the whole thing. I'm like... This is a good cocktail to know how to do. It's just like such a classic. So what's the main so alcohol yummy. in there? Cause I don't, I've never had one bourbon or whiskey, whichever your preference is. Okay. Cause I feel like whenever Mad Men was really popular yeah, and they would drink, I can't, maybe it was scotch. 
whatever they did, I went out because I thought, oh, I want to be like them. Now I did two, <laughs> my friend and my friend Sunday and I, we did two things. Uh-huh. We went out to eat and just ordered scotch neat or whatever oh, it was. Oh, that did not go well. Sophisticated. It, Ugh, gross. It, it was disgusting. And then yeah. we also, you know, smoked a few cigarettes because that, that's all they did on Mad Men. And it made Dime. me want to be them. It did. It really and then did. That also made me want to gag. And so. Yeah, those are both gross, unfortunately. Um, but, but old fashioned a, is good. But an old fashioned is really, really good. And it is like just a delicious cocktail to both like enjoy and perfect. And also it's cozy. It's a very fall drink. Like to me, it's very warm and it could be a little spicy. It's like perfect for right now. So anyway, that's what I'm loving. What about Instagram follow? (sighs) I hope you follow this person. And if not, I'm so excited to be the one to introduce you to him. Okay. Do you follow Vic Blends? No. Can you spell that? Mm V-I-C-B-L-E-N-D-S. Okay, so this is this young kid. I mean, he's in his 20s and he's a barber, but he like goes and gives haircuts to just random people everywhere, like in parks and on streets. But then while he's giving them haircuts, he just has the most uplifting, positive, encouraging, motivational conversations with them. And these are people from all walks of life, like everything. And I just love him. I have never seen one of his posts that I am like, wish I hadn't just spent two minutes on that. Just the world is so stupid right now. Everything's such garbage. It's just burning. It's just nice to follow somebody who's just like so dear and good and making you happy and having conversations that are inspiring. Please follow him immediately. You're going to be so happy you did. And then I want you to text me once you start following him because I know you're going to love him. Oh, yes. No, I'm already, I already hit the follow button and I'm looking at some of his posts. And yes, he's like, just goes to parks, cutting kids' hairs, and then he puts up the whole thing and he's like, I hope this conversation can help someone today. Uh Yeah, you'll love him. You'll absolutely love him. Like, and he's huge on TikTok. He's 2. Oh, well, even on Instagram, 2.1 million. Yes. So I follow him on his TikToks on Instagram because I'm old. My kids tell me that's what old people do. Um, I'm like, I don't care. I'll get it where I get it. And I get it on Instagram. So yes, you're going to enjoy him so very much. Okay, so I was I was going to actually ask you where you spend most of your time, but it is Instagram. On socials? Yeah, socials. I feel like I spend the most of the time on Instagram. It's it's the one that's the least awful to me. I pretty much quit Twitter. Um I quit yeah. Twitter mostly in 2020. I just couldn't do it anymore. It just the it, the law of diminishing returns applied to Twitter so much. It was where everybody was in my feed, the meanest, the maddest, the worst. And I'm like, if I don't love any seconds on this platform anymore, maybe I should just quit. So I'm really not on Twitter at all. I'm I'm still on Facebook and Instagram because I'm an old, I'm old. I understand that. Yeah. No, say, I mean, I, I get it. That's where I spend. I know I, I try to, I go on TikTok and then have you downloaded Be Real yet? Okay. My friends are all on it and I downloaded it to be a part of it, but all it feels like to me is homework every day when it beeps in and I'm like, I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> And so I've, I don't ever do the be reals. They're like, why are you even on here? I'm like, I don't know why. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. I know. Same. I'm like, some days I'm like, okay, fine. And then other days I'm like stressed. Cause I'm like, I only have two minutes to be real. But then I learned you can post late and I'm like, okay, you so can. I'll post it later. No big deal. But LOL. Yeah. I only have two minutes to be real. That's exactly how it felt to me. Like I, I just stop telling me what to do phone. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, if you want to see more of Jen on socials, uh, yeah, I guess the best place to look is, um, the Instagram and the Facebook. That's it. <laughs> is that, that's where us old people are. And then that's also where we the are. People, but people can see you in person coming up in November. Cause you're doing your, all the dish tour. Yeah. So, that's so if fun. people want to check that out, I know they can go to jenhatmaker.com slash events and see the different cities that you're going to go to. Mm-hmm. I think you're just knocking them out. Boom, boom, boom. A different mm-hmm. city yep. every night. Every city week. night. Yep, exactly. It's bananas. Okay. Well, Jen, thank you for taking the time and congratulations on thank you. Your, your new baby and stepping outside of your comfort zone. I'm so glad you did because I feel like this cookbook is just going to be so amazing and so many people are going to love it. And again, that's called Feed These People. And I'll link the the tour in the show notes too, just so you want to see if she's coming to a city near. I know you're doing Austin, Nashville, Dallas, Tulsa, West Des Moines, Houston. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. So maybe Mm -hmm. if you're listening, um, you can go and see her. Well, Jen, thank you so much. Love you. 
Love you too. I just always love talking with you and you're a huge encouragement to me online. And I, I've said that to you before, but I'll say it again in front of all the, the podcast world or those that are listening, because I think it's finding those people that, you know, you can follow or lean. it might not be someone that you talk to every day, but it's just, it's a testament to, to who you follow and how it can be an encouragement and social media isn't all bad. That's right. It can be used for good. So thank you for the encouragement that you are to me and so many others. You're welcome. Bye. Hey, I'm Melissa Fumero. And I'm Stephanie Beatriz. You may know us from television. Nine, nine. And now we're here with our very own podcast, More Better with Stephanie and Melissa. Join us as we take on topics like listening to yourself, the challenge of self-care, and making friends as an adult. We're going to share our struggles. We're going to speak to experts. And we're going to share everything we learn with you. Listen to More Better with Stephanie and Melissa on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey fam, I'm Simone Boyce. I'm Danielle Robay. And we're the hosts of The Bright Side the podcast from Hello Sunshine that's guaranteed to light up your day. Like our recent episode with fellow podcast host and sports journalist, Carrie Champion. The making it starts to subside. The, it, that doesn't become the goal anymore. The goal is, am I really being responsible with what I have been given? Listen to The Bright Side from Hello Sunshine on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. A new season of Bridgerton is here. And with it, a new season of Bridgerton, the official podcast. I'm your host, Gabby Collins. And this season, we are bringing fans even deeper into the ton. Watch season three of the Shondaland series on Netflix. Then fall in love all over again by listening to Bridgerton, the official podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to catch a new episode every Thursday. Hello, acclaimed comics writer and notorious Scott Summers hater, Rosie Knight. Well, hello, Emmy-winning podcaster and totally unbiased Targaryen royal supporter, Jason Concepcion. Somehow the X-Ray Vision podcast has returned. And like always, we'll be here every week. You'll hear from TV writers, actors, comics creators, pop culture critics. Nothing is off the table. Listen to X-Ray Vision on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.